Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Asil, and this is Unit 6, uh, Pearson at Excel International A-Level Chemistry. This was the paper in November 2021. So let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. Uh, the first question says, this question is about copper and some of its compounds. Two tests were carried out on separate samples of an aqueous solution of copper 2 sulfate. And the first test was a few drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to a sample of the copper sulfate solution. State what you would see. Okay, so we're starting with an aqueous solution of copper 2 sulfate. Remember that when you dissolve copper to ions, it forms a blue solution in which the copper is complex to six water molecules. Now, if we add a few drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide, this forms a blue precipitate because it forms copper to hydroxide. So, when we add a few drops of sodium hydroxide to a solution containing copper 2, it changes from blue solution to a blue precipitate. In test 2, he added a few drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid to another sample of the copper 2 sulfate, and then he added more of the concentrated hydrochloric acid until it was present in excess. So again, he's starting with copper 2 sulfate. At first, he's adding a few drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Remember that the solution of copper 2 was a blue solution. When you start adding concentrated hydrochloric acid, it starts to form the copper uh, four chlorides uh, complex so that the blue solution starts to turn into yellow. But at the beginning, there is only a few drops of copper chloride. So there is a green solution. And then once the concentrated HCl is in excess, then you have the complex of copper with four chloride ions, and that is a yellow solution. So what are the changes that would be observed? You're starting with a blue solution. When we add drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid, it starts to turn to green and then when we have excess of the hydrochloric acid then the solution becomes yellow. Describe a test and its positive result to confirm the presence of the sulfate ion in another sample of copper 2 sulfate. What was the test for sulfate? Of course we need to know the tests and you should remember that if I have sulfate, what do we add? We add dilute nitric acid and aqueous barium nitrate or remember that we could also add dilute hydrochloric acid and aqueous barium chloride. So either nitric acid with barium nitrate or hydrochloric acid with barium chloride. If sulfate is present, then we have a white precipitate of barium sulfate forming in the solution. An electrochemical cell was made from the electrode systems represented by these half equations. So these are the half equations that he got from the data booklet. And he's saying calculate the E cell for this electrochemical cell. Okay. Remember that both of these are equations in which electrons are gained. So these are the uh, reduction potentials. But then one of them has to be oxidation and one of them has to be reduction. So when we have two equations like this, we said which one would tend to lose electrons uh, more or which one would tend to gain electrons more. 
Remember that if you're looking at the reduction potentials, the one with a lower reduction potential is the one that will lose electrons. So it's the one that should be oxidized. So the equation for copper 2 plus going to copper should actually be reversed. And in that case, the sign of the E cell would be also reversed. So the copper 2 plus to copper, the uh, ele uh, electrode potential was plus 0.34. If I go, I'm going to have these two reactions, then the copper solid should lose electrons. And that means the E cell is a negative value. And the E for the whole cell is the addition of these two. So this would be plus 0.43 volts. Remember that you're supposed to write the sign whether it is plus or minus. Of course, if the E cell is a positive value, that means that this reaction is feasible. So copper solid would react with iron 3 plus to give copper 2 plus plus iron 2 plus. Okay. Then he says a student drew a diagram of an experiment to measure the standard EMF of the cell. Identify three mistakes in this diagram and the changes needed to correct them. Okay, this is the diagram he gave me. What is wrong with this diagram? Actually, there are at least three things wrong with this diagram. So, one of them, looking at the diagram, can you see that the half cell on the right has a solution of iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus and he put the electrode as an iron electrode. Remember that we said when we have a solution of uh, two oxidation states of um, a metal then the electrode should not be anything other than platinum electrode since that would be inert and will not take part in the reaction. So the iron electrode is a mistake. It should be replaced with platinum electrode. What other mistake in this diagram? He has a platinum wire connecting the two half cells. Is that correct? To connect the two half cells, we need a salt bridge. Remember that we said we need to put a salt bridge to connect the two um, half cells so that the ions are free to move. Okay, what other problem with this? The fact that he has a voltage supply. We do not put a voltage supply, we put a voltmeter because this reaction provides uh, an electric current, we do not give it a voltage supply. Okay, the next part of the question says brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. A student determined the percentage of copper in a sample of brass. And please pay attention to this kind of question. It repeats itself a lot. Where we have brass, which is made up of copper and zinc, and we're trying to determine the percentage of copper in the sample of brass. Okay, so what did he do? Weigh the sample of brass, place the brass in a beaker, and add concentrated nitric acid until all the brass dissolves. If you remember, when we put something that has copper in concentrated nitric acid, what we get is a green solution, and we get a reddish-brown fume of nitrogen dioxide gas. Okay, so he put the brass in a beaker and added concentrated nitric acid until all the brass dissolves. Transfer the solution and washings to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. Make the solution up to the mark with distilled water and mix well. Pipette 25 centimeter cubed of the solution into a conical flask. Neutralize the excess nitric acid in the solution, add 10 centimeter cubed of potassium iodide solution to the conical flask, and then titrate the iodine produced with 
0.1 mole per decimeter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution using starch indicator. Repeat the titration until concordant titers are obtained. This is how we determine the percentage of copper in brass. So we dissolve it in nitric acid. Then what we have is now copper nitrate solution. So this we make up to 250 and then we take 25 centimeter cubed of that and we add potassium iodide. Now, if we add potassium iodide to copper nitrate, this forms iodine solution in uh, the flask. Now, the iodine will be titrated with sodium thiosulfate and whenever we're titrating something that has iodine, we use a starch indicator. So, copper and zinc both react with concentrated nitric acid to form the metal nitrates, nitrogen dioxide and water. Write a balanced equation for the reaction of zinc with concentrated nitric acid. So, he's already telling me that zinc with nitric acid will give zinc nitrate, nitrogen dioxide and water. He doesn't want state symbols. Have I finished? Please do not say this is just one mark, so you don't need to balance. You have to balance. And it says balanced, and even if it doesn't say balanced, you have to balance. So counting the number of nitrogens after the arrow, we have three nitrogens after the arrow. So I need to increase the nitrogens before the arrow. I will find that in order to balance it, I will need to put four and two after the arrow in front of the nitrogen dioxide. This means now I have four nitrogens before the arrow, four nitrogens after the arrow. I have now four hydrogens before the arrow, so I put a two in front of the water to have four hydrogens after the arrow. And if you uh, count the number of oxygens before the arrow, I have three times four, that's 12. After the arrow, I have two times three, that's six, plus two times two, that's four, so I have 10 plus 2, 12. So this is a balanced equation. Name the most suitable piece of apparatus to measure 10 centimeter cubed of potassium iodide. Remember, he said just saying 10 centimeter cubed. He did not say 10.0. So that means I don't need to be that accurate. So I can use a measuring cylinder. State at what point in the titration the starch solution should be added. Do you remember what we do? Now, the first conical flask on the left is the uh, solution when we add initially the potassium iodide. So we add the potassium iodide to the copper nitrate. It forms iodine solution. That's the flask on the left. Now, we start titration until that uh, dark brown uh, color or reddish brown color becomes very faint. So, when the brown, reddish brown color becomes yellow, pale yellow, then I add the starch. When I add the starch, it becomes dark brown. That's the third flask from the left. And then I titrate until when all the iodine has been used up, then the color disappears and I get a colorless solution. So at what point are we adding the starch solution? We're adding it when the solution becomes pale yellow. Again, the flask on the left has copper nitrate plus potassium iodide, so it has iodine solution. I start the titration until the solution becomes pale yellow and then we add the starch indicator and we said before that we do this so that I can see the color change clearly because when I add the starch to the pale yellow then it becomes the dark brown and then when we titrate then I can clearly see when the dark brown color becomes colored. Okay, then he says only copper 2 plus ions in the solution react with the aqueous potassium iodide. So when he added the iodide, it reacts with the copper ions to form iodine. 
And this iodine, when we titrate it, it reacts with the sodium thiosulfate to form iodide, which is a colorless solution. He gives me the mass of brass, 3.90 grams, the titer of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed. So 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed is the concentration of sodium thiosulfate. And the titer, which is the volume, is 28.6 centimeter cubed. And he wants us to calculate the percentage by mass of copper in this sample of brass. Okay, so what's the first thing we have? We have the uh, concentration and volume of sodium thiosulfate. So we can calculate the number of moles of thiosulfate in solution. That is concentration times volume. Please do not forget to divide the volume by 1000. It has to be in decimeter cubed. So this is the number of moles of thiosulfate. Now, if I look at that second equation, I can see that two moles of thiosulfate react with one mole of iodine. That means the number of moles of iodine is half the number of moles of thiosulfate. Then when we look at that first equation, I can see that the number of moles of copper 2 plus is twice the number of moles of iodine. So 2 copper 2 plus forms 1 of I2. So the number of moles of copper 2 plus is twice the number of moles of iodine. But remember that what he did was he took all the solution, put it in 250, he made up to 250 and then he used only 25 centimeter cubed of that for the titration. So the number of moles of copper 2 plus that we have now is in only 25 centimeter cubed. We had a total of 250. So multiplying that by 10, you, give, you get the number of moles of copper 2 plus in 250. Now we have the number of moles of copper 2 plus. Then I can calculate the mass of copper. Mass of copper would be the number of moles. Remember, number of moles of copper 2 plus would be the same as number of moles of copper times the uh, molecular mass or atomic mass of copper. This gives me the mass of copper to get the percentage. It is the mass that we calculated over the mass of brass times 100. So we get that the percent copper was 46.6%. Please pay attention to this question because it repeats itself in many of the exams. Okay, question two says two organic compounds A and B are colorless liquids. Each compound contains only one functional group. Two tests were carried out on A, so we're starting with A. Complete the statements in the column. So what did he do? The first test, he says, a few drops of A were added to 2 cm cubed of a solution of 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine, and he got an orange precipitate. Now, what gives me an orange precipitate with 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine? Remember that this is a test for aldehydes and ketones. So that means A could be aldehyde or ketone. Then he did test two. A few drops of A were added to Fehling solution and he got a red precipitate. Remember Fehling solution is originally blue. If you get a red reddish precipitate, this is a test for what? This is a test for aldehydes. Only aldehydes will form a red precipitate with Fehling's solution. That means that compound A is an aldehyde. Give the name or formula of the red precipitate. Remember that the original blue solution was copper 2 sulfate, but when we have an aldehyde, it reacts with the aldehyde and it forms copper 2. Uh, copper 1 oxide, and that is the brick red precipitate. So the red precipitate that we have is copper 1 oxide. A simplified mass spectrum of A is shown. Give the formula of one of the ions responsible for the peak at M over Z29. Remember that we said A was an aldehyde. The aldehyde should have what? It should have the CHO 
functional group and if you calculate the total mass of this CHO that's 12 plus 1 plus 16 that is the one that will give m over z 29. Now A contains one functional group so we know it's aldehyde give the m over z of the molecular ion and the structure of A. First of all how do we get the m over z of course that is the one for the highest peak so the highest peak that we have is at 58 so that is the molecular mass of a so we know that a has molecular mass 58 it has the functional group cho because it's an aldehyde so you can try and determine what is the structure of a so if we remove the part of the aldehyde from 58 that means the rest is 29 so that means that the alkyl group in the aldehyde has an mr of 29 alkyl groups have a formula of cnh 2 n plus 1 remember it's just like alkanes but with one hydrogen replaced so that means the cnh 2 n plus 1 the total mr is 29 and that means 12 n plus 2n times 1 plus 1 all of this is 29 can you solve for n so that means 14n plus 1 is 29 14n is 28 and that means n is 2 and that means the alkyl group is C2H5 so my aldehyde is C2H5 CHO he wants the structure and this would be the structure aldehyde this is propanal in which you have three carbons and it is an aldehyde two tests were carried out on b now what is he telling me about b he says two drops of b were dissolved in two centimeter cubed of water and then a few drops of universal indicator were added to the solution what should be the color of the mixture if the solution is alkaline remember he's using universal indicator solution or paper and the solution if it is alkaline that means its ph is more than seven then the color of the mixture would be some shade of blue so just saying blue is okay B was added drop by drop so now we know that B is something that is alkaline. B was added drop by drop to aqueous copper 2 sulfate until B was present in excess. What did he get? He got a pale blue precipitate formed and this dissolved to form a deep blue solution when we have excess of that B. So obviously remember this was test for in our test this was actually test for um, ammonium ions or uh, a derivative of ammonia so that means that my solution is an amine so we had copper uh, water complex which is the solution of copper to sulfate and that was blue now when we add a small amount of ammonia or an amine remember amines are just derivatives of ammonia so when we add ammonia solution it forms a blue precipitate excess of the ammonia solution it becomes a dark blue solution so this indicates that I have an amine because in the end I have this kind of complex so that is the dark blue solution that is formed b has a molar mass of 59 so just the structure for b again we decided that b is an amine amine means it has an h2 in it and that means cn h2 n plus 1 with the nh2 the total is 59 so the cn h2 n plus 1 alone if I remove the part for the NH2, that is 43. Using the same method, 12N plus 2N plus 1 is 43. You get that N is 3 and that means my alkyl group is C3H7.
and he wants the structure, that means this is propyl amine. Okay, question three says, a student carried out an experiment to determine the enthalpy change when solid lithium chloride dissolved in water to form a solution. Use a pipette to place 25.0 cm3 of distilled water in a polystyrene cup. So we put 25 cm3 of water in the polystyrene cup. Measure and record the initial temperature of water. Add the 2.12 grams of lithium chloride to the water. Stir the mixture. Record the highest temperature reached. Give a reason, first of all, why a polystyrene cup was used instead of a glass beaker. Of course, in any experiment or, or reaction in which we're measuring temperature, we have to do this in a polystyrene cup, not a glass beaker, because polystyrene is a good insulator, so there would be less loss of heat to the surroundings. The temperature rise was 12.5. Calculate the enthalpy change for formation of this solution. Okay, to get the enthalpy change, we need to get Q. And you know that Q is mc delta T, mass of solution times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. So, if you remember, he said we put 25 centimeter cubed of distilled water into the polystyrene cup, so that is my mass. Remember that mass of water is the same as its volume because density is one, so 25 centimeter cubed is the same as 25 grams times C, which is 4.18, times the temperature rise, which he gives me as 12.5, this gives me the amount of energy in joules. So if I divide by a thousand, that would be in kilojoules. Then I need delta H. To get delta H, it is Q over N. That means I need to calculate the number of moles of lithium chloride. Now, what did he say? He said he added 2.12 grams of lithium chloride, and that means to get the number of moles, number of moles is mass over molecular mass. The molecular mass of LICL, uh, 6.9 plus 35.5, and you uh, divide the mass by that. So the number of moles is 0 0.05 mole, and we put that into the equation for delta H. Delta H is the Q that we got in kilojoules over the number of moles. So this gives me 26.125 kilojoule per mole. But remember, we have not finished. We have to put a sign. Delta H needs a sign. Now, what kind of sign should I put? Should I put positive or negative? He says the temperature rise was 12.5. Temperature rise means the reaction is exothermic, and that means my delta H is a negative value. Please do not forget the sign and the units, of course. Okay, the thermometer used to measure the temperature change had an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.25 degrees Celsius for each measurement. Remember that. When we're doing this experiment, we're measuring the initial temperature and the final temperature. So you're measuring the temperature twice. So to calculate the percentage uncertainty, you multiply the 0.25 by 2 over the uh, measurement that we took. So our temperature rise was 12.5 times 100, this gives a plus or minus 4%. That is my percent uncertainty. The temperature rise in this experiment was lower than expected due to heat loss to the surroundings. Describe changes to the procedure that would give a more accurate temperature rise. Include the use of a stopwatch and details of a graph you would plot. Remember that the way he did the experiment is not how we usually do it. We don't measure the temperature and then determine the highest temperature and that's it. What we, what he did was he put 25 centimeter cubed of distilled water in the polystyrene cup. He measured the initial temperature. 
He added the lithium chloride and he stirred and recorded the highest temperature. This is not what we do. What actually should happen is we should put, yes, we should put 25 centimeter cubed of distilled water and we start a stopwatch. Measure the temperature of the water every 30 seconds for three minutes. So I'm measuring the temperature of the water to determine initially what was the temperature of the water and I keep measuring it for three minutes. And then when we add the lithium chloride, we stir, we continue to record the temperature every 30 seconds until there is no more change in temperature or for about five minutes. Then we have to plot a graph of temperature versus time. And we join the two sets of points with straight lines extrapolate the lines to determine the maximum temperature at the time when I added the lithium chloride. Can you see what we did? We have three sets of points at the beginning. We measured the temperature of the water every 30 seconds for three minutes. And then we have the temperatures when it went up you extrapolate that line. We do not draw it as a graph. We join the points as a line, extrapolate it to the time when we started adding, when we added the lithium chloride, and that gives me the highest temperature. The question is talking about alkaline hydrolysis of an ester X. So he's saying X is an alkyl benzoate. So it's an ester of benzoic acid. And it can be represented by the formula C6H5COOR, where R is the alkyl group. And he's telling me that the hydrolysis, alkaline hydrolysis of the ester gives me the sodium salt of the ester, plus the alcohol, of course. The procedure he used, measure 5 cm cubed of X, put it into a pear-shaped flask, Add 25 centimeter cubed of aqueous sodium hydroxide, a few anti-bumping granules, heat the flask and contents until reflux for 20 minutes. Allow the apparatus to cool and then rearrange it for distillation. Distill the mixture and collect about 2 centimeter cubed of the alcohol. So first he did heating under reflux of the ester with the sodium hydroxide and then he rearranged the apparatus so that now it is distillation and he distilled off about two centimeter cubed of the alcohol allow the pear-shaped flask to cool pour the contents into a beaker add excess dilute hydrochloric acid. This gives him the benzoic acid as crystals. Recrystallize the benzoic acid using water as solvent. Weigh the dry crystals and determine their melting temperature. So he hydrolyzed the ester. This gives him benzoic acid and he did recrystallization of the benzoic acid. A student drew a diagram of the apparatus set up for distillation in step three. There are three errors in this diagram. Assume the apparatus is clamped correctly and appropriate heat source is used. What is wrong with this diagram? Identify three errors and how they should be corrected. So, what problem is with this setup? Well, the first thing is, He's heating it in a conical flask. We don't do this in a conical flask. We do it in a pear-shaped flask. So he should have a pear-shaped flask instead of the uh, conical flask. What else? He's collecting it in a test tube that is sealed, that is closed with a bunk. You cannot do that. This will build up pressure inside the apparatus. So collecting the distillate in a closed test tube, that's a mistake. It should be opened or there should be a ventilation, uh, a side arm for ventilation, or just remove the stop or the bunk. 
Okay, what other problem does he have with this diagram? Well, can you see the thermometer? Do we put the thermometer into the reaction mixture? That's totally wrong. So the fact that the thermometer is inside the reaction mixture is wrong. The thermometer should be up. Its bulb should be near the entrance to the condenser. It shouldn't be down inside the reaction mixture. Okay, then he says the distillate collected in step 3 is the alcohol, ROH. Describe a chemical test and its positive result to show the presence of alcohol. So what was the test for alcohols? Remember that the test for alcohols was add phosphorus pentachloride, PCL5, and we get misty white fumes of uh, hydrogen chloride. So my test would be add uh, phosphorus pentachloride, we get steamy fumes of uh, hydrogen chloride form. This is a test for, actually it's a test for OH in alcohols or in acids. Write an equation for the reaction taking place in step 4. Use structural formula for the organic substances. State symbols are not required. Okay, what was step 4? Step 4 was the one where he said, allow the pear-shaped flask to cool, pour the contents into a beaker, add excess dilute hydrochloric acid. So in step four, where did he do, where, where did he get the contents of the pear-shaped flask? Remember, what did he have in the pear-shaped flask? He had the ester with the sodium hydroxide. And we know that the ester with the sodium hydroxide gives me the sodium salt. So that means that I'm starting with the sodium salt of the benzoic acid. I'm reacting it with HCl. This gives me benzoic acid plus sodium chloride. This is already balanced, so I don't need to do anything else to it. State what should be done to separate the benzoic acid from the mixture produced in step four. So in step four, we have uh, the benzoic acid and the mixture of excess dilute hydrochloric acid and so on. The benzoic acid are crystals. So when we say we want to recrystallize, the first thing I should do would be to filter the crystals through filter paper and funnel. Remember that filtration can either be normal filtration with filter paper and funnel or filtration under pressure. We say that this is filtration under pressure in which we use a Bachner funnel. This has a porous base and the filter paper is covering the porous base. And then I have a pump that helps to um, suck the solution down from the funnel into the flask. So this is a faster filtration. Describe the first stage in recrystallization. When he says recrystallize the crystals, how do we do recrystallization? You should remember, I have a solid. I want to make sure it's pure, so I recrystallize it. How do I do that? I dissolve the crystals in a small amount of the solvent. He said using water as solvent. So I'm going to dissolve the crystals in a small amount of water. And then I heat it to boil off uh, some of the water so that I have a saturated solution that I can leave then and form, uh, allow it to cool and form crystals. The melting temperature of pure benzoic acid is 122. State two ways in which the melting temperature changes if the benzoic acid is not pure. We said what is the effect of impurities on melting temperatures? Remember that impure will melt. First of all, it will melt over a range. If it is pure, it melts sharply at its melting temperature. But if it is impure, it will melt over a range and its melting temperature will be lower than that of the pure solid. This is the effect of impurity on any solid, on the melting temperature of any solid. Impurities cause the solid to melt over a range and lower its melting temperature. The molar mass of X 
x is c six h five c o o r is one seventy eight. What is the formula of the alkyl group R? Again, that means that the total M R is one seventy eight. So the we have actually seven carbons c six h five c o o r. So I have seven carbons, five hydrogens. Uh, two oxygens and the R. All of them are 178. I can get that the R alone is 57. And that means that the CnH2n plus 1 is 57. And I can solve for N. Solving for N, N comes out to be 4. And that means that my alkyl group is C4H9. And that means we can draw structures of the possible alcohols. So the alcohol he wants the R group with the OH. If I have C4H9OH, what are the possible structures of these alcohols? Well, I can either have the OH on the first carbon, one butanol, or on the second carbon, two butanol, or I can have a branch, so this is 2-methyl-1-propanol, or when we have a tertiary alcohol that has four carbons, this is 2-methyl-2-propanol. So he wants the structure. So these are the structures of the four possible alcohols that have four carbons. Then he says the part of the carbon 13 NMR spectrum of X corresponding to the R contains only two peaks. So he's telling me that R has only two peaks. These were the structures. Which of these will give only two peaks in the carbon 13 NMR? Okay, let's look at one butanol. One butanol, I want something that has only two peaks. One butanol has how many? Actually, all the carbons are different. So if I do the carbon-13 NMR, I should have four different peaks. 2-butanol, again, all four carbons are different. 2-methyl-1-propanol, the two CH3s are the same. So the two CH3s will give me one peak, and then the CH one peak, and then the CH2 one peak. So this gives three peaks, not two. But what about this last one, 2-methyl-2-propanol? All the methyl groups will give one peak, they're all equivalent. And the carbon to which the OH is attached, that's another peak. So this one gives me only two peaks. So this is the structure of the alcohol that was formed. But what was X? Remember he said X was C6H5COOR. So now I know that the R is the one that has the tertiary butyl group. So the structure of X is the benzene ring C6H5 with COO and then tertiary butyl group. That's the structure of X. Okay, and that was the end of this paper. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, thank you for listening and please keep sharing and uh, listening to the videos. Thank you.